Hello and thank you for watching my video. My name is Astrid Krasnici. I'm CCNA and CCMP certified instructor. On this video we are covering CCNA semester 4, Connecting Networks. And this is chapter 3, Point-to-Point -point Connections. Section 3.3, .3, Configuring Point-to-Point -point Protocol. On this section we configure HDLC encapsulation on Point-to-Point -point Link Serial Link. And then we configure a PPP encapsulation on a Point-to-Point -point Serial Link and we configure PPP authentication protocols. PPP basic configuration command. To enable the point-to-point -point protocol, so if you remember, HDLC is our default, we have to enable, uh, we have to access the interface, so serial interface, give it an IP address, and then enable the point-to-point -point protocol. To set the PPP as the encapsulation method used by serial interface, use the encapsulation PPP interface configuration command. The encapsulation PPP interface command has no arguments. Re remember that if PPP is not configured on a Cisco router, again, default is HDLC. Point-to-point -point protocol is layer 2 encapsulation that support various layer 3 protocols including IPv4 and IPv6. And, be sure, we have to configure on the other side as well. They have to match. So, both side encapsulation PPP. Once we enable encapsulation PPP, then the PPP configuration commands will be available for us. Compression, the point-to-point -point software compression on serial interface can be configured after we configure, we enable the PPP. Compression, we can use a predictor or stack. Because this option invokes a software compression process, it can affect the system performance. So really what it's saying to you, don't use it that much. Because it's a software compression and it does uh, make the routers lag. So, two compression methods that we have is predictor and stack. And if all files are already being compressed, such as zip files, are transferring tar or MPEG, do not use this option. Both sides have to be use the same compression method. Link quality ma monitoring command: the PPP quality 80, that's 80 percent. Link control protocol provides an optional link quality de determination phase. In this phase, the LCP tests the link to determine whether the link quality is sufficient. Uh, sorry, the link quality is sufficient to use the layer three protocols. The PPP quality percentage command ensures that the link meets the quality requirements set; otherwise, the link closes down. Closes down. The per percentages are calculated for both incoming and outgoing directions. So, PPP quality 80%. Or, uh, as long as it's 80% or higher. We find is we can have this link if it be falls below 80% then bring the link down if the link quality percentage is not maintained the link is deemed to be in poor quality and is taken down the link quality monitoring LC LQM implements a time lag so that the link does not bounce up or down so you have to configure on the other side as well the multi-link the cool command is like you can bundle uh, two serial links into one uh, we can bundle them multiple multi-link bundle so two serial links into one so we can increase our bandwidth so first we need to access the serial link so interface s010 and in there don't give an ip address but we enable the ppp so encapsulation ppp we enable the multi-link and we tell what group does it belong it belongs to group one and we do the same for the second inter uh, serial interface and no IP address, enable the PPP, encapsulation PPP, enable PPP multi-link, then tell what group does it belong. Now we have created a virtual multi-link interface, and in there we give an IP address. IP address, whatever, IPv6 address, and now we say there is a multi-link, and this is group 1, multi-link for group 1. Verifying the PPP configuration, show interface serial and then inter the serial interface in question. It will show us that we have enabled PPP. When you configure HDLC, the output will show the serial command encapsulation HDLC. Here we can see that LCP has opened the, con uh, the connection and the NCP states also display. We have IPv4, IP IPCP and IPv6, IPv6CP. Show PPP multi-link commands verifies that PPP multi-link is enabled on R3. The output will indicate the interface multi-link 1. 
as a virtual interface, the host name of both the local and remote endpoints, and the serial interface is assigned to multilink. So we can say the host name R4 and R3, they are the multilink, and two interfaces connected to that multilink. PPP authentication protocols defines an extensible LCP that allows negotiation for authentication protocol for authenticating its peers before allowing network layer protocols to be transmitted over the link. The RFC 1334 defines two protocols for authentication, PAP and CHAP. PAP is very basic, two-way process. There is no encryption. The username and password are sent in plain text. Not very good. It is, it, if it, it is accepted, the connection is allowed. CHAP is more secure than PAP. It involves three-way exchange of shared secret. One of the many features of PPP is authentication. Initiating PAP, PAP provides a simple method for remote node to establish its identity using two-way handshake. PAP is not interactive. When the PPP authentication PAP command is used, the username and passwords are sent as one LCP data package rather than sending a server sending a login prompt and waiting for a response. After the PPP completes the link establishment phase, the remote node repeat, repeatedly send the username password pair across the link until the receiving node acknowledgement acknowledges or terminates the connection. Completing PAP, at the receiving node, the username and password is checked by an authentication server that either allows or denies the connection, an accept or reject message is returned to the requester. PAP is not a strong authentication protocol. Using PAP, passwords are sent across the link in the plain text again, and therefore no protection from playback attacks. Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, or CHAP. After authentication is established with PAP, it does not re-authenticate. This leaves the network vulnerable to attack. Unlike PAP, CHAP only authenticates once. Um, uh, sorry, unlike PAP, which authenticate only once, CHAP conducts periodic challenge to make sure that the remote node still has a valid password value. The password value is variable and changes unpredictably while the link exists. After the PPP link establishment phase is complete, the local router sends either a challenge message to the remote node. The remote node responds with the value calculated using a one-way hash function, which is typically message edges 5, MD5, based on the password and challenge message. The local router checks the response against its own calculation of the expected hash value. If the values match, the initiating node acknowledges the authentication. We're going to see it very soon, what happens with CHAP. The flowchart provides a visual example of the logic decisions made by PPP. When we have an incoming point-to-point -point protocol negotiation, we check first is authentication config configured. If it's not, we start the PPP. If it is, then we check what type of authentication. Local, where we check our local database, or security server, where we check our security server, like radio server. Does authentication pass? If it does, yes, we start the PPP. If it doesn't, we discard or we disconnect. Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol, CHAP. R1 establishes an authentication point-to-point -point protocol, CHAP connections with R2. So R1 wants to talk to R2, establishes the link. Step 1, R1 initially negotiates the link connection using the LCP with the router 2, and the two systems agree to use CHAP as authentication during the PPP LCP negotiation. Then R2 will generate an ID and a random number and sends, that, uh, sends its username as a chap challenge back to R1. So we'll say, okay, well, can you create a hash using this ID, this random number? And I'll send my username as well because you can check my password. So I'll, you need the ID I'm sending you, random number, and our password to uh, create, a challenge, uh, create a hash. So R3, step three, router one uses the username of the challenger R2 and it will cross-reference with the local database to find the associated password. So it will find the R2's password. And then it will generate a unique MD5 hash number using the router2 username, ID, random number, and the shared secret password. So it's got quite a few information. The ID, 
from root 2 random number that root 2 has generated we will use the root 2 username and the password to create this hash in this example we have a broad block password root 1 then sends the challenge ID the hash value and its username to root 1 to root 2 root 2 generates its own hash value using the ID and the shared secret password and the random number it originally sent root 1 so root 2 now it has a root 1 uh, username so it will have username of root 1 find out the password right and then with that password and his own username plus the ID that he's generated and random number and comp generate his own hash from the hash then it will compare it if it does match then we can let allow the link so R2 will compare its hash value with the hash value sent by router1 its values are the same router2 sends a link established response to R1 if the authentication failed a chat failure back uh, packet is built from the following components 04 chat failure message type ID copied from the response packet authentication failure or similar text which is meant to be user readable explanations configuring password authentication protocol so in the global configuration mode you create a local database uh, username r2 in the username has to reflect to the username or host name of router 2 or host name of the other router the other party so whatever host name that router has has to be on this router's local database so username r2 password same one so they have to have the same password router 1 and router 2 in this case they have to have the same password and then you go to the uh, serial interface you give an IP address obviously IPv4 and IPv6 address if you want and then enable encapsulation PPP and say the authentication or PPP authentication PAP this time and then say PPP PAP send authentication send username R1 password same one so we're gonna send username R1 our host name to the uh, router 2 with the password same between router 1 and router 2 uh, mirror configuration has to be done on router 2 and this time we are creating a local database with a user 1 a uh, router 1's uh, username uh, host name and password same as router 1's and then we after we enable ppp on the serial interface we say that authentication is going to be pap or ppp authentication pap and then we say send username r2 and password same one when we configure in CHAP, configuration CHAP or challenge handshake authentication protocol, again, we do the same as we did for PAP. We create a user, a local user, da user uh, database by saying username R2 or the host name of the other router. Password is going to be the same one. And then after we go to the interface on the CHAP, after we enable the encapsulation PPP, we only say PPP authentication CHAP. We don't tell uh, send this or send the other one. We just say what authentication we're going to be using. And there is going to be a mirror configuration of router 2. Thank you for watching my video. Please have a look at other videos. And don't forget to subscribe. This has been Astrid Krasnichi. Uh, the next video, upcoming video is 3.4. Troubleshooting wide area network connectivity. Thank you very much and goodbye.